we have a nation built on the Declaration of Independence, but we don't take it seriously. So we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to establish new government, laying its foundation such principles and organizing its power such form as to them so seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So those words from the Declaration of Independence were revolutionary in 1776. They still are today. And they still are today. They're you took, you took my so words. incredibly profound that if you just had a think tank on those statements that you just made, and the funny thing is I've read that line so many times because I embody that and I believe in the spirit of that. And although you can pick at it, you can say, yeah, but slavery existed. when the, Absolutely, we needed to redefine what a human being is. But if you go to that statement and you really pull the the juice from it you pull the best parts of it. it is one of the most profound statements in human history all right another podcast from the michigan institute of athletics in brighton michigan it's going to be a stellar podcast today right before i get into it i want to shout out vet life vet life is a 501c3 nonprofit company it's a company of veterans for veterans Every veteran faces difficulties when they transition from active duty back to civilian life, and VetLife is there to ease that transition. If you want to reach out to VetLife, you can do so through Instagram or Facebook, or check out their website at vetlifetoday.org. So without further ado, I want to introduce Michael Warren. Uh, Michael, for the people that don't know you, this is how I start all my episodes. I want to take it all the way back. I don't want to know about the man that you are today yet. I want to start with, like, where were you born and raised? What was your family life like? What were like the things that shaped you as a young man or things that you felt were very influential to your progression? And then we'll start to build up to who you are today and what you're doing. All right. Well, I am a uh, child of uh, Detroit. I was born in the city of Detroit in August of 1967 at St. John's Hospital. My um, mother and father were very young. They were um, in the 60s, uh, barely, you know, about 20 when they had me. And um, they started, um, we started living in the city of Detroit. My dad, um, and both of my parents did not go to college when I was born. Um, eventually, my mom uh, went to community college, became a nurse, and she worked midnights. Uh, my father uh, ended up going through a series of jobs and became um, an employee of the state of Michigan. He's, uh, he was a bureaucrat. He worked uh, for a variety of different things, but basically he chased people down that were delinquent in their child support. That was his job. Uh, called a child support specialist for the, the last few years of his, uh, well, couple decades of his uh, career. Um, I went to Detroit Public Schools uh, up until we moved to St. Clair Shores in uh, Macomb County in uh, sixth grade. Um, I was, uh, I love baseball, great baseball fan. Uh, th- my dad took me to see the Tigers when I was five years old. We saw a doubleheader with the De- Indians, uh, the Cleveland Indians, uh, saw around the floor steel home plate, uh, which was amazing. You know, you never get to see that. And um, just became a huge baseball fan. And I was a pretty good baseball player as a young kid. Um, was pretty shy. Um, and I, I think with each passing year, I've become less shy um, and less of an introvert. Uh, I um, was thankfully my parents are both very smart and they put a lot of stock in uh, being educated. Uh, school was the number one priority. Uh, so I worked hard to uh, get good grades and thankfully I was successful in that. Uh, we went to St. Clair Shores. It was a totally different culture. I, I was a pretty popular kid in, um, in Detroit. And then St. Clair Shores, it was like culture shock and kind of reset my whole social life and it took a while for me to adjust and build new friends and um, kind of an interesting uh, period of my life of trying to uh, uh, how old were you during that move that would have been uh, like let's see uh, like uh, caught 11 so sixth grade through eighth grade middle school was terrible for me just terrible uh, because I was still kind of in the Detroit culture and the way I dressed and all that kind of stuff um, had bigger hair and you know that kind of thing, 
and then eventually um, kind of snapped out of that and developed a great set of friends. Interesting enough, most, many of them were not from my high school. They were from De La Salle um, and uh, Brother Rice. Created a great bond of friends. Um, and I'm still great friends with them. We call ourselves the Band of Brothers, uh, brothers from another mother. Um, we were very, very close. So I was very fortunate there. In high school, um, I was a very good student. Um, I uh, was really passionate about uh, science, and I was also passionate about um, American history and government. And tried to decide what I wanted to do with my life. Um, did very well in the ACT, um, and decided that I would become a public servant versus a scientist. For a long time, I thought I'd be a genetic engineer. And I thought, the problem with genetic engineering is that I'm going to be in the lab all day long. And um, I was not particularly good at the lab, but I didn't find it all that interesting. And so I decided I would go into um, law and the, the, as a way to public service. So it's really been on my heart to be a public servant um, ever since high school. And do you think that was inspired a little bit by your father being, you know, working for the government and he's already doing things that's serving your community and the public, so it kind of passed down to you? Or did you always just have a spark for your community and other people? Or maybe did that come from your moves? Because, I like, I, I moved multiple times as a child as well, and it is a strange reset. And you realize how much you're shaped by your friend group, by your surroundings, by your environment. And when you get, like, a mini cultural shock, you even a, just a different city, it's like, wow, like, I have to fit in a little bit different in here. I have to start all over again. These people don't know my identity. What do you think shaped you into wanting to serve people? Um, it was really in my eighth grade social studies class. We were going into uh, an election year. We had a teacher that was very passionate about um, public service and um, government and politics. And we did like a mock election and we had to pick a a uh, candidate that we were in favor of and all that stuff. And it was the 1980 presidential election. And I really liked John Anderson, who was, n most people don't remember, but there was Mondale, Reagan, and then another Republican who ended up running as an independent, John Anderson. And I just thought he was really cool at the time. And so um, we had to make speeches and presentations about uh, our candidate. And I really got engaged in that. And I also, at kind of the same time in another class, um, a speech class, realized I actually had a talent for speaking, that I could draft a speech and deliver it pretty well. Um, and um, that combination just made public service make a lot of sense. Um, and even when I was interested in science and being a genetic engineer, my long-term goal is I'll start a company, I'll get rich, and then I'll run for public office. It was always either, you know, public service was kind of in my heart, started in middle school. Um, and I've just always been very engaged since. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's kind of been a calling for you. No matter what right. you did, you knew that the path would lead back to public service somehow. Exactly. Do you remember right. what about uh, Anderson was appealing to you as a young man? Because, like, when we take inspiration from men or ideas and things, it's very powerful. It kind of, like, gets that flame lit in you. And, and even you telling the story today, I can feel the energy that you had for that. What was it about him that stood out to you? And why in the world would he run independent when the odds of winning as independent right. is almost non-existent? But why were you drawn to his, you know, him as a person? Well, as a younger person, so my, my family... Um, my not just my parents, but my broader family were very um, liberal in their orientation, and the they either were Democrats or they were at least um, independents, but mostly voted Democrat. Um, but I was living through the era of Jimmy Carter as president, and uh, it's it's somewhat like today. There was very high inflation. There there was also very high unemployment. The interest rates were going through the roof, and um, we had the, um, the our, our 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 embassy had been invaded by the Iranian revolutionaries. They had taken over the embassy, and so this is my formative period. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to support this person. And um, then I saw Reagan, and because all I really knew was the more liberal side of politics, I said, whoa, he seems a little too strong. Anderson was kind of in the middle. He was more of a, what you call a moderate, 
a Republican. And he had a pretty, he was pretty engaging. He was charismatic. He had a good message. And um, so that's kind of why I, I ended up uh, uh, in the class, at least, being his uh, advocate and doing the research on him. Um, and I, I, um, I was a little, I didn't really, and I will blame uh, the public schools for this, I didn't really understand the Soviet empire the USSR, how dangerous they were, their undergirding revolutionary ideology of trying to take over the entire world, how terrible communism was. I had not been exposed to um, the uh, genocidal tendencies of Stalin and Mao. Uh, I learned a lot about Nazi Germany, but I hadn't learned from the left and what they can do. And, um, and so I didn't necessarily see the threat as much, um, which... Reagan was standing up to, uh, and made that a big uh, centerpiece of his campaign, and so um, I think that was part of it. So uh, eventually, um, I learned a lot more about the Soviet Union and what it really was about, and, and communism, and um, the the terrible history that they have for human rights, and with the Gulag Archipelago, and the massacre of political enemies, and the suppression of freedom of speech and religion. Um, so I, I totally turned into a cold warrior once I became more educated about it. Uh, but at the, you know, back in middle school, I didn't have that background. 100%. So you think nowadays the man that sits here would have maybe sided more with Reagan. You would have understood why he was such a like iron fist against that thing than when you're a young kid where right. we're beaming with compassion and we're overly emotional and we aren't as deeply educated so that we can understand, like you said, what group identity politics and things like that lead to. If you look at those throughout history, they're atrocities, but they don't come on quick. They come on in stages and there's things that lead to it. And a lot of the things that you were just saying Currently, you can almost see reflective in today's culture, which is a little bit terrifying, you know, so let's continue with your story. So you're you're getting through high school, you know, you're, you're in middle school now, you're getting into high school. Tell me right as you're leaving high school, what is the vision? You know, are you going to college somewhere? What is your pathway? Had you fully separated from the lab idea? Kind of build that part of your life for me. Yeah. So in high school, um, obviously very formative uh, era. Uh, era of my life. I, again, I told you I, I built up that friend uh, group, um, started to do a couple of jobs, and um, I was a swimmer. I learned a lot in the pool. That was a great experience for me. And I decided, you know, there was no question ever since I was five that I'd be going to college. That was always what my parents had told me. And, um, and I said, yep, and I'm going to, I want to go to public service. So the way to get to public service is to go to law school so that I can become a prosecutor and then get into public service. So that was the goal. Um, Wayne State was uh, wonderful. They gave me a full ride scholarship and I knew I needed, I was gonna go to law school. So my family was of modest means. So full we got, ride scholarship because of your swimming? No, 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 no. I was a, I was a co-captain of the swim team, but I wasn't a particularly great swimmer. I was just a modest swimmer. Um, no, it was the academic scholarship. So I kind of cut a deal with my parents. I said, yeah, I'll go to Wayne State. I'll stay at home another four years, and uh, if you guys save money and can pay for law school, awesome. And so that was kind of the deal that we had, which was great of my parents. And so I um, went to Wayne State, and there I kind of fell into um, debate. Um, and also, I, I don't want to say I fell into history. I uh, ended up becoming an honors uh, history major, but as an honors major as a pre-law major I received two separate invitations to join the debate team and Wayne State has a phenomenal debate team it's had it for over 50 years uh, 60 years and um, it's unusual that really good programs have walk-ons I was not a debater in high school and but I'd always been interested in it but it conflicted with the swim team and so I you know chose swimming first and um I wasn't, some people told me I was good enough to swim at Wayne State. I was like, ah, no, that's all right. I'm going to, you know, I'm focused on other things. Um, but I got uh, this invitation to do the debate, and I knew that would probably be good for um, law school and to be a lawyer. I actually started with a thing called individual events, which is like public speaking, uh, where you kind of, depending on the circumstance, it's not really a competition where you're debating against people. It's you're, you're performing on your own. 
and um, my debate coach convinced me, he debated me, uh, to become a debater. And he won. And he won, of course. We call it the spread. Like if you have a bunch of arguments and they're really fast, you can't, you don't have enough time to respond. So he spread me, convinced me to be a lawyer, and, or excuse me, convinced me to be a debater. And that was the best decision of my life because that's how I met my wife, was on the debate team. Um, and she, you won that debate then. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. Kind you know of what I'm you, right. you convinced her to stay with you forever. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a big win. Yeah, that's pretty much the only debate I've won <clears throat> with my wife since I've been married. But um, uh, so I was a debater. We traveled across the country. Uh, the, the big tournament's called the National Debate Tournament. It's kind of like the NCAA for um, you know, the, 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 the March Madness, but for uh, debate. And I was able to go to that three years in a row. Uh, which was very unusual for a walk-on novice debater to be able to do that. And I give all the credit to Wayne State's debate program. Um, and I, I became more and more conservative-oriented uh, as um, at Wayne State, more engaged politically, although I never really – I never volunteered for a campaign. I didn't donate or any of those things, but I, I was learning about the world and, and learning um, – it was really the history classes that taught me um, what the foundation of the country really is. And um, that really uh, made, motivated me even more because what I realized was we had these founding first principles for a Declaration of Independence and a Constitution that had been adopted um, with certain ideas in mind and that they were being um, neglected and, and forgotten. And that made me very, very concerned. So here we are fighting against the Soviet Union in a Cold War with an existential threat with literally tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. And meanwhile, our population is losing the whole understanding, the whole reason why we're standing up to the Soviet Union. And that really scared me. So uh, I started working on a book um, when I, um, I guess I started, I, I started thinking I need to write a book um, probably in law school, and I started researching the book and going, uh, and then I got into Michigan. Praise God, go blue. Um, so I got into U of M Law and um, went straight from undergrad to uh, law school. The other, the other thing about Wayne State I guess I should share is that I worked my way, although I had the scholarship, my parents didn't give me any money, so I worked as a busboy at a place called the Gourmet House in St. Clair Shores and bus tables and set up parties and drove trucks and got the equipment together and worked the parties. And it was actually a quasi managerial position. I was the head bus boy. So I was in charge of all the other bus boys and telling them what to do. And bus boy is kind of a, we did more than just busing. We did a bunch of stuff. Um, so, you know, set up the catering, uh, the tables and uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot through that as well. And there was a lot of hustle and grind in that period of your life. You know, you're in hustle. college, you're learning, you're debating, you're working, you're leading people. You got, I mean, cause there is a leadership role there. Even if it's over just people that are busting tables, learning how to effectively manage people and be a leader is a massive skill too. So yeah. you're almost giving yourself the platform for success that you're going to need. You're in debate. You have a small leadership role. You're, you're fa taking on all these different facets of what a true leader needs to be able to embody. So as you're coming through college and you're learning more and more, you've said you became more conservative. Why was that? A lot of young people are very liberal. And nowadays, there are people that are anti the Constitution. They're anti a lot of the things that America was built on. And it's creating a very strange climate because if you don't believe in the founding principles of your nation, how do you unite? How do you come together as one and like try to stop the darkness or the madness, however you would classify that, and like live as a people in, under a certain umbrella, right? So you were saying, as I became more educated, I became more conservative. Whereas in my mindset, a lot of the institutions nowadays and a lot of the colleges are extremely left-leaning. But you had the opposite effect. Why was that? Well, it was, it was pretty simple. It's interesting because my, my academic advisor at Wayne State is still at Wayne State. His name is Professor Mark Krumen. He's an awesome person. But we don't necessarily see eye to eye on, on a political and uh, other things, but we're, we're very united in um, trying to educate people about our American history and civics. And what, what struck me was that uh, we have 
a nation built on the Declaration of Independence, but we don't take it seriously. So we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to establish new government, laying its foundation such principles and organizing its power such form as to them so seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So those words from the Declaration of Independence were revolutionary in 1776. They still are today. And they still are today. They're you took, you took my so words. incredibly profound that if you just had a think tank on those statements that you just made, and the funny thing is I've read that line so many times because I embody that and I believe in the spirit of that. And although you can pick at it, you can say, yeah, but slavery existed. when the, Absolutely, we needed to redefine what a human being is. But if you go to that statement and you really pull the the juice from it you pull the best parts of it. it is one of the most profound statements in human history you know and for some reason we've got off course so you went deep into that didn't you and it, it, it affected your soul you said like this is something that we should be fighting for that's exactly right so uh, what i agree with everything you said so what i did is i i started to learn what did the um, founding generation mean when they said What's an unalienable right? So let's let's stick with that one because that's it one that cannot be taken from you. It is a, endowed upon you. It is if you are in this universe, you are entitled to it. No government can take it from you because they don't give it to you. You possess it. I think that is something that young kids don't understand. But I, anyway, sorry for no, interrupting you. No, again. that's exactly you're you're exactly right. That's the fact that you're a human being. You're born with these rights. They're given to you by the Creator. Nature, nature's law, whatever you want to call it, you have them because you're born. And you don't have to go to the government to beg for them. In fact, the purpose of the government is to protect your rights. And that is an understanding that is mostly lost in today's society. Absolutely. And, and people think that they, they can't do anything unless the government says they can do it. And it's the opposite. And some people have the disposition that, well, um, you know, we... we we're, so, we're, we're going to depend on government to take care of us. Well, the government is supposed to be our servant, not that we're the servants of the government. But there's a lot of people that think that they're, they can't do anything because they have to be, you know, the government ha has to take care of it for them. Um, so there is a fundamental disconnect between, and it's not true for everyone, and I don't want to use a broad a brush, sure. you know, there, there are certainly exceptions, and and there are great schools out there and great teachers who are trying to teach this stuff, um, but it's not a priority. It's the back burner priority for, if at all, for the education system, and so this idea of unalienable rights is just taking one example, is literally lost in in um, the K through twelve system, and then when you get into college. Normally, I don't want to say normally, there are plenty of people in the ivory tower that don't believe that. They're, they believe that people get their rights through the law or through the government. or whatever. So they're teaching opposite ideologies, and students never receive a real education in the American founding. So it's easy to say the America, you know, America stinks or is terrible or is corrupt or evil if you don't understand it. And you're just getting a caricature of it, uh, which is what most people get now through the, the mass media and through education. It just seems, though, that when you consider these ideas, like let's take slavery for an example. I don't care if the government says it's legal, that you can own people and you can do these things. I would fight against it because it's not right. What that piece of paper says or what's written down is completely irrelevant to me. Now, that might make me an outlaw. That might make me doing something illegal. But human rights and what is right should transcend anything that people write on paper. Otherwise, corrupt people can put things onto paper that only benefits them and not others. The idea of unalienable rights means that we are all equal so if you're fighting for this idea, this utopian world where every human being is given the best chance possible, you should be in full support of a statement like this. And you should be in full support of a nation that tries to understand that to the core. Not that the government 
hands you the ability to live your life the way that you want to do it, but that that is what you are by being. I don't know how to make it any simpler than that. It's what you are by being. And I think so many times, um, actually, before I go into this, what I'd like to ask you about is, because you're extremely knowledgeable on this, and you also said your professor is extremely knowledgeable about, about this, you both have access to the same information if you're both good human beings, because you said, hey, I love the man. He's, you know, he's made a great impact on me. How is there such a difference in belief and opinion and ideology when you both understand the same information and you're both good people? Where is the disconnect then? Well, l- let me, um, I, I don't want to make it sound like there's a chasm between us because there isn't. And what, what I would like to say, and this is, this is an analogy that I think, um, your sports fans would appreciate. Okay. So football field. If you look at the history and understanding the philosophy of America, um, there's always, first off the founding fathers and subsequent generations, they they don't all think the same. So there's disagreement with amongst themselves, but there is a range of views that, um, they pretty much agreed on. You know, you might, you might say we can, um, it's not a good idea to have a high tax. Somebody else would say, you know, a high tax is okay. But they both agree that you can't have a tax without consent. Okay, no, no, no taxation without representation. So there were these fundamental things that undergirded um, the entire society. And then you fight um, amongst each other about some policies. So taking the football field, that means we're fighting between the 40-yard lines. Okay, that there's this middle, the 50 year, and we're going to fight over what the meaning of the Constitution or a public policy, but we know there's things that the government should never do or that are bad public policy or immoral. And over time, what's happened is that with the change in education, the changes of uh, the demise of... of uh, or the lack of education. Lack of education or people that are uh, fundamentally opposed to the, the, the founding era and our fundamental principles, we've expanded the football field. So some people now are in the end zones, all right? And you're like, this is way off. Makes sense. So That's a f- my, phenomenal my, analogy. My professor and I, we might be on the opposite sides of the 40-yard lines, but whatever result we have, the country is going to be fine. We're going to, you know, everybody's going to, be able to move forward. It doesn't violate people's fundamental rights, all those kinds of things. Where if you're on the end zone, you know, if you're the communist and fascist or whatever, um, you're fundamentally, you just, of course, you know, so that the, the extremists are really the threat almost always, right. right? The extremists are the ones that are say like the freedom of speech shouldn't exist, right? You shouldn't have the freedom of speech. If you offend someone, you should go to prison. Like that happened in Canada. I don't know if you've been right. following the case. Yeah. If you misused someone's pronouns, you could be put in prison. Right. That is, how can I call you an asshole and all these other things? And that's perfectly legal. I can say all, I can call you all these things that are my opinion of who you are. But if I mispronounce you, I could go to jail for it. Mm -hmm. That's an incredibly slippery slope. And I, and I'm someone that supports like whether you are male or female or you want to be identified one way, I would support you in that. I, if you said to me, hey, I would like to be referred to like this, I would do that just because I, that, that's just me trying to be a good human being to you. But the idea that I could be like put in prison if I did it incorrectly or if I offended you, that goes down an incredibly difficult road where that is where you're talking about the erosion of basic principle right. at that point. Right. Well, and another thing that I think is important is that we hold these truths to be self evident. So there's this idea of truth. And what's happened on the end zones are people say, no, there is no such thing as truth. That, that is ridiculous. Right. But that's, that's what they say. You know? and, and what's important is our context, uh, you know, circumstances, how people feel, emotions. And so when you don't believe in truth, then anything is possible. And that's when the whole, there isn't even a football field. Anymore. Yeah, the entire thing collapses. You just hit a nail on a head majorly on a way that I've been trying to feel, but I couldn't quite articulate it feels like people are not concerned with the truth anymore. They don't even care. It's like your someone's feelings and opinion is just as valid because it's their feeling. That is factually wrong. Like if I don't feel like one plus two equals three and I believe it should be nine and you are like, you're right, you know what? It can be nine. 
We no. are eroding the entire system. One plus nine is a banana. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you, you, you're eroding the entire foundation that we collectively as people can come together on. Because if there's not, a, not truth in the basis of what we live upon, what are we living upon? So that is a good way to look at what's been going on lately. It's almost like this erosion of the truth, logic, facts, things that matter. And like everyone can have an opinion. You can, but someone needs to be able to tell you like your opinion can be wrong, distorted, way out in left field. Debate taught you that. Debate right. showed you that whoever could argue a an idea more efficiently, more effectively with a stronger case was the winner. You know what I mean? And that's a beautiful thing. And it's good to understand that like we are just trying to I'm not it's never me against you. Whether I'm right and you're left or I'm white and you're black or I'm rich and you're poor, it's not me against you. It's us against problems. It's us against, you know, bad ideologies. It's us it's how do we get back together? And generally the truth has to be in the middle of that, right? Otherwise, we're living in delusional worlds. That's a, The way you've broken this down on the podcast has been phenomenal. That football field analogy is really good. And like you said, ex- extremists are where the whole system is almost toppling. Right. Can you explain to me, before we go to, I want to talk a lot about like what you're doing now, the position you're going to be running for, how you became a judge. Like I'm super excited to hear your story. But real quick, can you explain the differences? When you were growing up in the nation – People were kind of sold in on like freedoms and your amendment rights and like you knew what America stood for. Tell me the patriotism that kind of existed then. And like I think it was a big influence on driving you into being the man that you were and what you're seeing in today's culture. Because like I said before the podcast, almost I'd say 90 percent or more, Michael, of the people that come into this gym couldn't even name three amendment rights. They don't even know the laws of the land that they live in, you know. What was it like? What was the patriotism like? I wish I could have grown up in that era. Tell me what it was like then versus what you're seeing with the children now, and then we'll continue building your story. Well, it's a great question, and I would say um, I don't think that I grew up in a particularly patriotic era because I grew up in the 60s and early 70s. I think the most patriotic era that of people that I ever talked with um, and knew was what some people call the greatest generation. So the people that came out of the Great Depression and World War II and into Korea, those folks really loved the country. And they, they were fighting between the 45-yard and the 45-yard. Um, they, they had a, a real deep appreciation of the blessings of liberty that Americans had. They, they knew what fascism, communism, the threats that they posed to their own people as well as to the entire world, to freedom and liberty. They sacrificed tremendously to, um, to protect it. And, and I think patriotism was sky high. With the Vietnam War and the troubles in the 60s, some quite, I mean, the civil rights struggle was needed, it was necessary, but we had a division of the country, mostly around Vietnam, but some also on the, on the civil rights struggle. Um, the civil rights folks, I would say, uh, were still very patriotic. Very patriotic. What they were saying is, we got this Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and you're not treating people equally. So they were, they had grounded their argument on our foundational documents. It's an amazing cause. Right, as well as on the Constitution. So they, they, they had grounded it. There was no, you know, we should be workers of the world, unite, so that we could, I mean, there was some of that, but most of them were very deeply patriotic people that wanted to improve the country and have America fulfill its promises. Like um, Martin Luther King Jr. said, you know, to, with his promissory note, you need to f- fulfill it. Um, then when uh, then there was the Carter presidency and things were kind of a mess, Reagan really emphasized patriotism. And uh, I do think there was an upswing in patriotism in the 80s and early 90s, very, very strong Especially, even with the younger generation. Fact, I felt it. Yeah. When I, was, I, grew up, I was born in 87. Okay. And it, I felt, I bought in. Yeah. I really thought like this is one of the most incredible lands on yeah. the in the world. We can make this place the land of the free and the home of the brave. Like I bought in fully. Yeah. I wanted to read the Constitution. I wanted to read the Decla- Declaration of Independence. When you were reading that quote to me earlier on this podcast, I was remembering the words as you're speaking. I'm yeah. like, and it it affected me. 
And I remember those feelings. And I also believe it gives an incredible support for like uniting. I don't see that thing as divisive at all. I don't see the kind, I see it as uniting. Like we stand on something, you know? So, so I do, I do feel that way. Great. So, and, and, um, I think that feeling, it, you know, Bill Clinton was very patriotic. Our, excuse me. Our, most of our, our um, major political leaders were n- always trying to fulfill the promise of the Declaration and the Constitution. And it's been, um, but there was also um, an emphasis in education away from civics and history and the Constitution and the Declaration and towards math and science, which was necessary. But... Um, education in those realms became much less important. And I think that... Um, Why do you think that is? Because that seems like the most important aspect of what you could teach a child is like the laws of the land of, that he lives in. Why do you think that is? I, I think it's f- for two reasons. There's probably more. Um, I do think that there is a... St- and some people may criticize me for this, but in the Ivory Tower, the progressive era, the original progressive era with Woodrow Wilson and those folks... They really um, were highly critical of um, the general foundation of the country. They really wanted to have experts, and they really believed in uh, bureaucratic experts and that, that focused on one kind of issue. Um, they felt that they could, um, they could find the one best way to develop a solution to a problem and that government was a positive good that should uh, – harness its energy to improve the country and they saw kind of the constitution and the declarations impediments to that because we have a federal system with all these states and you know the states should go along with the experts in washington dc we really don't need these folks in the states. i understand so there so there was some of that going on and the academy the ivory tower said you know we should get away from facts and figures and focus more on themes and kind of propagate this this uh, view of the world. So, and honestly, in a weird way, I've never thought about this before. They're still trying to move things in the right direction. They just believe instead of letting the masses at the bottom of the pyramid having as much power as they do, almost like funneling it to the top of the hierarchy and being like, we're going to give all of the ability to these people because we entrust their decision making more efficiently. I've never thought of it that way, yes. but that's kind of how you're breaking it down. Yeah, that, and that, and that's that clearly is a strain in the in the academic uh, field and the ivory tower. And then there was also um, you know the Sputnik era where we were all of a sudden we woke up and we were well behind technologically from the Soviet Union, and that was seen as an existential threat, which it probably was. And so they spent a lot of time and energy on science and math. Um, a little bit on reading, and just made social studies kind of an afterthought. And I think that wasn't malicious. I just think they, they, they took their ball off of, as you said, the most important thing. Because you can win the space race, you can, you can have this great military, um, but if you don't know why the country uh, should be free, uh, you can use, lose your freedom overnight. You know, the, I, I was alive when the Berlin Wall fell, I never thought I would see it fall. It was shocking to me and probably most of the country, maybe not to Reagan, but pretty much everybody else. And um, if the Soviet empire can fall like that overnight, that the, there's no reason why we can't fall like that overnight. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that our people don't understand our basic foundations in our constitution and our declaration of independence. They, they see, po- they, they don't, I would say the last few years has been a tumultuous maelstrom, and, and there's been um, some people pointing things out, and there's been some litigation um, uh, kind of anchored in our founding first principles. Uh, but for the vast majority of people, uh, they're tuned out. Uh, they're, they don't know what to believe. They're just entertained, usually. They're not even looking at the deep issues, Michael. Uh, they're, they're just entertained. Right, and so... Um, that that really undermines our our ability to survive as a free people because we're in charge of ourselves. We don't have a king. We don't have a dictator, which means we get the government we elect or allow to happen. And um, if you don't understand the basic foundation of your freedom and liberty, you're going to lose it. And, and one of the things that I've been discovering more as I've gotten older, it's really not a battle of 
anything more than just like good versus evil or like right versus wrong. Like a lot of these battles that are taking place of whether or not you believe in letting the power come from here or you let the power come from the top, good people are going to try to move the needle one direction and bad people are going to, or corrupt people are going to try to move it another direction. And it's almost like as an entire nation, we have to look at the trajectory of where things are heading and saying, are things getting for the better or are they getting worse? Like when you broke down that, the way you just explained that last thing, I could almost support a system where you were trying to give the people at the top of the hierarchy more authority to make decisions. If I saw overall, it was the experts and good moral human beings that were like putting their foot down on what is right based on the principles that you had stated earlier. Like I I would even support that. But when I look at the way that things are going, I don't see good people at the helm, fists in the air saying, we are going to make sure that we get provide the best life we can for the people. I don't see a better way than what the founding fathers created hundreds of years ago in probably one of the most brilliant, some people call it a living document of all time. When, when I hear you argue it that way, I can see the appeal of of their ivory tower theme. I can see why you would think that's great. Let's let the people that are most educated, most invested, just make the decisions. The problem with that is it doesn't account for the human beings that are doing it. It doesn't account for real world examples of corruption and how things can be easily taken off course and how money and all these things can alter people. The average citizen in the country wants to take care of their family. They want to find their pursuit of happiness. They want to love on their wife and their children. And a lot of them want to be left alone. They want to be like, hey, if I'm not breaking the law and I'm not trampling your rights, like just let me live. And when you start to take all the power out of those people and you give it to those experts based on the other thing, they might say, well, you know what? Your opinion on how you should live is completely wrong and we're not going to allow it. And that's where I feel like the whole thing will start to crumble. What the Constitution almost protects people against is it's saying, no, the power isn't coming from here. The power only resides here. Your only position, your position only exists to make sure that these people are empowered to live their lives the right way. But I can see the appeal. I can see how young kids, if me and you sat down and let's say we only wanted to preach that, like, don't you believe the experts at the top should be the ones guiding policy? It's very appealing. Right. Right. If you're not well educated on the topic, I think you could get sucked into that super easily. Right. There's a old political theory called, uh, you know, an enlightened despot or an enlightened king. So somebody that that is uh, kind and wise and understanding and gets all the information, and then they can they figure out the the right solution, and then they can just you know snap their fingers and everything. It sounds awesome, idealistically, right? Right, right. right. Sounds awesome. And what we've learned through history very painfully is that even people with the best intentions, when they're, you know, there's an old adage, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. That's true. I mean, there is is no example. I mean, the fundamental question, though, is why? Because let's say you're a good husband, a good father, a good man with morality that was raised in a country that truly believes that he wants to give the best for the people. Why in the world would that corrupt you? Why can't you stand on the fact of doing the right thing? Right. Okay. So f- there's corruption, there's tyranny, and there's a uh, lack of information. Okay. So let's say you have a great person that's not a tyrant that, that, um, is not corrupted. We have 330 million people in this country. They all have, they know what's best for them based on their individual circumstances. Anybody in D.C., one person in D.C., was to say it's a king or a congress or whatever, they don't have the information about how to affect some, what they, first off, they don't know what the 330 million people individually want. They don't know if they pass a policy that there could be unattended consequences. When they pass a policy, they likely means that a big portion of them can't do what they thought was right because the policy that the guy thought of doesn't know the individual circumstances. So 
That's why the power has to reside in the people. So the power has to reside in people because even if you have someone that's well motivated and is not corrupted, they just physically don't. You know, we we have a system that's designed like a pyramid, and um, the first layer is the people, and then they elect, um, you know, municipal governments. So there's cities or villages or townships in Michigan, and those people. You can walk down the street or take a five-minute drive and get to your city council, and you can talk to the city council. You can write them a letter. They're going to be very responsive because most people don't bother, and they want to make sure they get reelected. And so they are highly incentivized to, to at least hear the input. Maybe they disagree with it, but they, they'll hear the input. They're very accessible. Very engaged. Above that's a county usually, and a county – you know, depending on where you live, could be a few thousand people to uh, over a million people. But they have county commissioners. They're elected out of districts. Those people, again, generally are very accessible. You can go to your county commissioner, go to a meeting, go to a county commission meeting, public comment, uh, you know, inform them, write a letter, you're going to be resp- responded to. And the city council typically deals with things that you care about. There's streets, there's garbage, there's fire, there's police. Uh, county might have sewer and you know economic development and some other things, uh, and law enforcement for for uh, a good portion in courts, and then the state. So you've got you know the smallest state's got about it's called seven hundred and fifty thousand people in it. Um, the biggest state's got you know California's got thirty million people, whatever in it. Your your ability to influence the state's much less. You can go to your local representative, but. They're going to have a big district. There are going to be thousands of people in it. It makes sense. It makes sense. Right? And the state senate, the same thing. And then to try to influence, like if you want to go talk to your mayor, chances, I mean, even if for the big cities, chances are pretty good you can get some kind of response out of your mayor. You want to get a response out of your governor, much harder. It's hard, you know, there's this barriers to be able to, to, to get influence. Then you're talking about Congress. So that you know, we got the states. Then you got Congress on top of that. Well, Congress, when they first started Congress, there was thirty thousand people represented by each congressman. That sounds like a lot of people. Really, it's pretty small. It's no, small. I thought that's better. It's much smaller than the current state house member in in Michigan, for example. Now it's seven hundred and fifty thousand people, at, at the average. You know, so. That's really hard to get influence. And then senators, there's only two for a state. So you might have two senators and 30 million people or 10 million. So your ability to influence policy that's coming out of D.C. and the president, right, is infinitesimal compared to your city council. So you want, we want to push power down as much as possible. That makes sense because they're, they're the boots on the ground. Those the, are the people directly connected to the community. Right. But right. it's almost like there's a certain system now where it's trying to pull all the power up, which is not for the good of the people. It needs to push the power down. Right. But right. Power in government wants more power in government, right? Like right. it's it's kind of the battle we're waging. Right. And and so, you know, we believe that we have a social compact, which is that the people have given up their power, for example, to defend themselves, um, or to, uh, maybe not defend themselves, but to if somebody steals your TV, you can't sure. chase them down and beat them up and take the TV back. We, we have police for that. We don't have vigilante justice. And uh, same thing with other, you know, the military and the border and all those kinds of things. Um, so we believe in consent. It's fun. That's why we had a revolution in part, because they were taxing us without consent. There's a whole bunch of other reasons. There's 34 grievances. That's just one. But the, um, the point is, is that um, it's fundamental – to our beliefs that we we have a government, it's supposed to be responsive to us, accountable to us, and we have to consent. Well, when all those decisions are peeled off to Washington, D.C., our level of consent is infinitesimal, and then they give it to bureaucracies, which have the elites in it, and they're not accountable to us at all. So there's a real disconnect between our, our, our system of belief and how we've designed our Constitution and the reality. And so, as you said, there's been this pull to make all these local decisions get sucked up into Washington, D.C., and that breaks the social contract, compact, excuse me, breaks the social compact, 
makes them less accountable. All those other, th- they, they have less information because you go to city council, you have 15 people talk to you about the problem on, you know, Madison Street. You're going to know about the problem on Madison Street. There's nobody in Washington, D.C. is ever going to know about the problem on Madison Street, right? So it's, um, it, it's a serious problem. How do we work to change this? Because it makes perfect sense. I guarantee you anyone that listens to this podcast is going to go, that makes perfect sense. And unfortunately, at least from an outsider's opinion, it seems like this society is run by the rich. This society is run by the people that will donate the most. How do you get elected? Raise the most funds. The people that raise the most funds are most often elected. So then what is the representation really going to be for? It's going to be for people with money, with power. It won't be for the average people. It will be for people with money and power. How do you change that? Because we can't just say, well, there shouldn't be money in politics. There is. So how do people, in your opinion – actually start to change fun you know in the direction that is best for the nation is it just as simple as starting to run for local offices as good human beings and kind of like building it again from the ground up or what are your opinions on when i say something like that it seems like the society is run by the rich what do you think to that well um it's taken more than a generation to get to where we are today and there is no magic bullet and there's no magic wand that's going to resolve these issues and solve these issues. And unfortunately, it's going to take a long time to get us back more centered to what I think we should be. Just back to near that 50-yard line, man. We're, we're right. getting awful far from it. Right. So the first thing is to educate people so they understand what we're talking about. Um, they, they do – overall, the system does a terrible job on history and civics education. Um, and so, you know, which should be the first priority. Um, you know, there were two things that public schools were really created to do. One was to teach people how to read the Bible so they could be saved. And the other was to teach people American history and civics so they could be informed, educated participants in the republic. And unfortunately, you know, that second prong, well, obviously we don't teach the Bible in schools unless it's the Bible's literature. And um, we, we clearly don't. Uh, do a very good job on the history and civics. So I would make that number one priority because that would people would then say, wait a minute, we're a federal system. Why is Washington, D.C. doing this as opposed to my city council or my state or my county? So that would be – that would make a huge difference. I think it's also demanding that people that get elected um, abide by the Constitution – and there are some people that you know, every once in a while get up in the Senate and they'll say, you know, I'm not going to support this because uh, this is an issue for the states or it goes beyond the, the enumerated authorities of the federal government. Um, that we need more people to take seriously the Constitution and, um, and, and the proper role of government um, that are elected. But that's on us to elect people to do that. There's this unfortunate thing, though, that I've been witnessing that – Let's say you have the most powerful speaker in Congress, you know, standing on these principles, pushing these ideas. He's got, let's say, the full support of the people. We have the idealistic candidate. It's almost gotten into this team party system where, like, the Democrats are going to give you your five or ten minutes to speak. And when you're done, th- those words went right in one ear and out the other. They're not going to change their mind. They're not going to change their policy. They're not even listening to you. They're just going through the motions to let it happen. Or let's say on the other side, the Republicans, you're trying to push a certain issue through that is, that is the right thing. They're, they already know. Their mind is already made up. This, this two-team system, I don't even think there's real debate going on anymore. I've, been wa- I've watched some of these hearings, and someone can be incredibly articulate. They present a beautiful point. It's clearly on the side of reason and just, nope. All right, th- thank you for your time. I appreciate your words. It doesn't seem like there's any real accountability to like because we don't have a divine arbiter that can say this is not correct. You are not allowed to do this because we don't believe in tyrants. We don't believe it's someone at the top. But when you have this this concept of how to make change and you're a man that was in debate. So you understand how important dialogue is like two parties speaking together and actually taking each other into consideration and trying to find the gray areas not to shout that out, but the gray area. That's the right answer, right? I don't even see that anymore, Michael. I don't I don't see two opposite parties trying to come to resolution. I see one team battling for every victory on this side and one team battling for every victory on this side and pointing fingers and hating people on the other side. 
that system has fallen so far from what we're speaking about that how does that change happen? All right, so you've, you've asked a great question. Um, there's nothing that you and I at this podcast can solve that issue. Uh, but um, there are – so I've, I've been trying very hard to create um, a – first off, we have to stop screaming and – now, of course, I just hit the microphone at the exact time. We have to stop. Sc- we have to stop screaming and um, demonizing each other. We got to be human beings first, right? We're human beings first. We're, we have a divine spark in us. We should respect each other and respect others as if they're they've got that spark in them. And um, so we need to bring the temperature down, and we need to do it in a way that's informed. So what I've been trying to start and. Um, wish me luck on it, as I've been trying to talk to some leaders that are like-minded to convene um, little summits where we bring in folks and start to talk about, bring in high schoolers and college students and people from the general community to start to talk about the need to be civil and the need to understand civics. So I call it the Civics and Civility Initiative. And I've gotten some, I don't want to I can't say anything right now because we're still working on it. But the, but the idea is that we would, I believe that it is going to come from the bottom, that there is no way that the people that are in charge in Washington, D.C., for the most part, there, there's some exceptions, but that most people, um, they're not going to change because it's working. OK, they will respond to what works. So what we need, we need to change this is the hardest thing to do. We need to change the people, people that are coming up the people that are coming up so that um, they're and, – and the electorate in general needs to stop rewarding this bad behavior. That, that's, what will, that's what will change. And how do you do that? You st- with the education. So we've got – I've got uh, two initiatives and that kind of – the civics and summit thing is – the civic summit thing. What I was hoping to do is create a, a caucus, a civility and civics caucus within the legislature where they would start signing off on, like, here's the Declaration of Independence. We believe in this, and we believe that we should be civil to each other. And they start getting legislators to sign on to that, and then uh, you may remember there's this thing called the no-tax pledge. Um, people you say, yeah, I'll, I'll pledge not to raise taxes, and they pretty much – kept to that so we give them you know make this pledge that you will be civil to each other and you'll try to uh, any public policy you got to look at the declaration of the constitution and try to get them to embrace that um so that that's that with the summits and some education reform might start moving us in the right direction well at least you're taking action i'm trying uh what you're saying already is actually no matter what we have to take action right right like we can complain about things we can say this shouldn't be that way the question is like how can we actually move the needle i love hearing about what you're doing this is this is excellent thank you so then the other thing okay so you've got the book over this i wrote this book um several years ago america's survival guide i will be reading this in the next couple weeks great and um the subtitle is How to Stop America's Impending Suicide by Reclaiming Our First Principles in History. And a lot of people thought that was a silly subtitle, like we're the greatest nation in world history. How can we fall apart and commit suicide? It's happened to empires hap- throughout history. It's hap- exactly. And um, uh, most people, I think, today would agree that we are not on a good path. And put aside the economics, I mean, just politically, as a country, we are starting to tear each other apart. I watched people celebrate a police station being burned to the ground. I watched a police sergeant get shot in the face and die on Facebook Live. Wow. In Missouri, a a black gentleman, a sergeant, shot in the face, died on Facebook Live. I saw people celebrating that in the comments because he was a police officer. I watched people. I've never seen the type of hatred and division in my lifetime that I've witnessed in the last couple years. So there is no, like, maybe. We absolutely are. Right. You know, and that's why people need to take action. If you're a good human being, you need to drop every label from the people that you think are your enemy. Who cares if they're Republican or Democrat? Who cares if they're white or black? Who cares if they're rich or poor? You need to say, like, if this is another good human being, we need to get together and figure out how do we support things that are going to move the needle in the right direction. Right. So the book goes through um, the what our founding first principles from the Declaration of Independence are the rule of law, unalienable rights, limited government, the social compact, equality, and the right to alter or abolish and oppressive governments. 
It goes through the Constitutional Convention, how those first principles are put into the Constitution, the Civil War and the Civil Rights struggles, the amendments to the Constitution that have enfranchised um, African Americans and women, and then uh, the Civil Rights struggles, and then has a set of recommendations about what to do. Um, and, and there's this multi-pronged you know, education reform, media reform, political reform, things like that. Then, after I wrote that, I was having uh, lunch with my then 10-year-old daughter, Leah. And what I didn't share with you about my history as a growing up was that when I was uh, a young man, a, a young person, uh, not a man, a young boy, uh, I, I'm, I'm the product of a disaffected Catholic and a disaffected Jew. And so I was raised as a nothing. And um, my dad would always say, Mike, you can believe anything you want. Just remember, it's all bullshit. So, George Carlin. So I became a very adamant um, atheist. And I stayed an atheist until high school. And then I became an agnostic. I said, well, maybe there's a guy, maybe there's not. I'm not sure. And then of all places, in Ann Arbor, in law school, the Holy Spirit found me and I converted overnight, much to the shock of my family and friends. And I called my little short Italian grandma and said, Grandma, you're going to take me to church this weekend. And she went, Michael? I go, yeah. She goes, is this a joke? I go, no, you're going to take me to church this weekend. And I did. And eventually I converted, even got married in the church. And I tell you that because I learned about the liturgical calendar. So, you know, there's... At, all the great religions have this idea of holidays and stopping the hustle bustle of a day to renew your faith. So in the Catholic and the Christian traditions, you know, we have Pentecost and Advent and Easter and uh, Christmas. You know, do we really think the Lord was born on Christmas Day? No. I mean, I don't think even the Pope tries to defend December 25th. But the idea is you stop in the hustle bustle of a day to renew your faith. And all the great faiths have this. And I realized... Um, that America used to have a civic calendar for the same reason. We had Washington's birthday, Lincoln's birthday, Memorial Day, Independence Day, Thanksgiving, Armistice Day. Why? To stop in the middle of your day to renew your life, to renew your faith in America. But what we've done, like so much else in our culture, is we have cheapened and hollowed out and commercialized those holidays to be empty excuses for three-day weekends, go up north or go to the shore, um, barbecues and appliance sales, right? That's carpet sales. That's what we've done with those holidays. So I was explaining this to my then 10-year-old daughter, Leah, and she said, Dad, that's wrong. We need to do something. We need to start a new celebration for America. And so I went, whoa. You got her fired up. I got her fired up. I was like, okay, I got to, I, I can't uh, complain and not do anything. So um, we ended up starting what we call, because we had to be audacious and couldn't just pick one day. We decided to do a week. And we've caught it Patriot Week. It goes from September 11th to September 17th. Uh, the 17th is the anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. So, yep. And then the 11th is obviously the anniversary of the terrorist attacks. Although some of your younger viewers and listeners may not really have any recollection, may have been born well before that, and don't really know what that day's about. And I know that the public schools have done a pretty bad job in teaching about it. Uh, but um, we wanted those anchor dates because there were – people that um, were struggling with what to do with those days. So every day we celebrate a founding first principle, like the rule of law and animal rights, limited government, social compact. Key documents and speeches that embody that, like the Emancipation Proclamation, the I Have a Dream speech. Uh, the suffragettes had um, a declaration of, they call it the Seneca Falls Resolution, which is basically the Declaration of Independence, but instead of saying all men are created equal to all men and women, and, you know, they modified it. Um, the Bill of Rights, other um, documents. Then we had uh, key uh, patriots, either founding fathers or other great patriots. So we've had Martin Luther King Jr., Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who's a suffragette, uh, Susan B. Anthony, James Madison, uh, Patrick Henry, et cetera, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And then my daughter said, um, Dad, we should, have, um, we should have fireworks. We need the kids excited. We should have fireworks. And I said, Leah, you're right. We need to get the kids excited, but fireworks, you're, they're expensive, you got to go outside, it's kind of taken. She goes, oh, yeah, you're right, Dad, let's, let's have flags. And so we, every day we have a flag from our history that most people don't have an excuse to learn about, except for Patriot Week. And uh, what we've done is we've had parades, paloozas, festivals, uh, panel discussions, uh, reenactments, um, 
all kinds of fun activities, uh, gubernatorial debates, uh, just a whole a wide array of activities. We have, uh, so if you go to patriotweek.org, you can learn about the upcoming events, but we also have a podcast, uh, American History and Civics podcast. Uh, we have a TV show called Patriot Lessons um, TV show. We have uh, uh, videos and we have lesson plans. And then if you're by yourself and you want to celebrate Patriot Week, let's say you're in Zimbabwe, we have a set of things that you can do uh, each day to, to celebrate. And so that has been, uh, thankfully, uh, unanimously approved by the U.S. Senate three years in a row. i got to give my kudos to Senator Peters from Michigan, who's a Democrat, and Senator Kennedy from Louisiana, who's a Republican. Uh, they don't agree on a lot of policy, but they agree on this. Um, and so does the entire U.S. Senate. So that's great. Um, this is tremendous. And then we've had, uh, thank you, we've had ab uh, about 17 different states through governor proclamations or um, legislative resolutions adopted a number of counties and cities. And um, we have a 501c3 nonprofit that's been going strong for, so we've been doing it, this is our 13th year. So it's, it's really exciting. My daughter's still involved. Uh, she gives a great uh, give me liberty or give me death speech off the top of her head, um, dressed up like Patrick Henry at one of our events, our fundraiser. And so um, that initiative is intended to deal with all the things that we've been talking about. Because we, because nobody, you know, when you celebrate July 4th, except for there's a few houses. My house, we all read the Declaration of Independence. I pass it around. But most people don't do that. You know, they eat a hot dog on July 4th and they don't consider it to be a solemn occasion where they're renewing the spirit of America. So Patriot Week is designed to do that. And if we could get the world or the, the nation to start being more involved in Patriot Week, that would also help with all the issues that we've been talking about. I'm sold 100%. I Thank love you. that you're presenting solutions. I was wondering today, because I, I was planning to ask you about some of these things, like how do we actually make a difference? And the idea of like just getting back to the basics that's what I do when I'm training fighters. We focus on the basics. We fo focus on the principles of the sport. We focus on why are people successful at a high level? Well, because they understand the fundamentals. If we don't understand the fundamentals of the nation and what provides a good nation for people to raise children in and to be a part of, then how in the world would we create that thing? Right. You know what I mean? It's like Einstein used to say, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. That's one of his quotes. And that's the idea that if we get down and we take a complex problem, we break it down to the simplicity of it, maybe we can build a proper solution. I'm sold 100%. So we've, we've gotten a little off your story, and I don't want to skip it. So when you were getting out of college, you got your law degree. You went straight into being a prosecuting attorney? No, I never I never became a prosecutor. Ah, so you went with the <laughs> path of that, but then no. when you graduated college, something a, a different course takes your life. Yeah, so uh, after law school, so I was, um, I love law school at, in Ann Arbor at University of Michigan. And when I graduated, I, I worked for Dorothy Justice Dorothy Comstock Riley of the Michigan Supreme Court. I did that for two years. Then I went to go work for a major law firm in Detroit called Honigman Miller, um, and that was great. But I got called away to work for the State Board of Education as kind of their policy lawyer guy to develop education reform. I did that for a couple of years. There was a window of opportunity to change the law. Uh, that, were, that window closed. I went back to Honigman Miller. I became um, in, a partner in their corporate uh, and securities uh, division. So I did mergers and acquisitions, all that, all that kind of stuff corporate counsel, drafting um, contracts. And then I got called away again to go work for Cornerstone Schools, which at the time was a set of faith-based schools in the city of Detroit. And I was, um, there was a foundation. I became the executive director of the foundation, and I also was the vice president of the schools. I did that for a couple of years. And I got called away again to uh, take an appointment to the Oakland County uh, Circuit Court in Michigan, and I've been on the circuit court. Uh, Governor Engler, praise God, appointed me at the very end of his term. I think I was his last appointment to anything. And uh, so I've been on the bench for 19 and a half years. Wow. Yeah. So you have done public service your entire adult life, as you set out to do as a child. You said, like, this is the path that I'm going to take. You didn't go into, I'm going to create a company and, and do this. Y you fell into public service your entire life. When you were working directly for the Supreme Court and you were working for these high legislative uh, officials or even on school boards, do you find that your type of thinking 
the way you're so all in on the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the ideas that build the nation, is that very commonplace? Like, did you meet a lot of others like you in those positions or were you an outcast? Like, where would you be on the bell curve? Um, I, that's a great question. I would say that, um, first off, I don't know anybody that was in public service that was malicious. Okay, so there's no, you know, people out there like, I want to cause harm. I'm going to take this position and, and do something wrong. I agree with that. Okay. But when I sit and speak with you, Michael, I yeah. believe in you. I believe in the message you're sending. I believe in the man that you are. I believe in the fact that you would try to move things the right way for the nation. But I don't see that happening from yeah. our officials. Well, so there has to be a disconnect yeah. here. Well, first off, I, I appreciate the uh, the compliment. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, th there are I, I know, how would I put it? I know a number of people in public service in the past or e even today that are well informed and they believe this stuff, but they're they're a minority. So if we had, you know, a majority of those folks, there would be significant changes. The problem is you need significant changes both in Washington D.C. and the state to make it work. Um, and so, uh, and to, and to really do that, you'd need a, a Congress, uh, a Senate a filibuster approved Senate, a president and your state legislature kind of all on the same page at the same time, which is extremely difficult. Um, and some of the changes that we've had that's happened, um, in the past, perhaps away from what we would have thought as the governing principles, um, but uh, there, there certainly are a number of people that are, are good-hearted that, that do understand this. I, I'm not going to – I don't want to puff myself up. There are not a lot of people that have written a book and, you know, created the holiday and, and know it to the, and the depth, but they do kind of, um, you know, have a, a good understanding generally of, of what ought to be the, the right role of um, the people and the government and the Constitution. So you don't think things get done because the – most educated, most impactful people aren't the majority of the elected officials. Is that how you're breaking it down? Because, like I said, if there's a if there's an entire group of people like you, it, we're going to move in the right direction. Or at least we're going to be back to battling over the 40, 50-yard line, right? Right, right. But is it just the fact that people that are running and that are being elected haven't dedicated enough energy and focus to what they're supposed to be standing upon then? I'm trying to understand where the disconnect is. Right. Well, I guess the answer is yes. And the reason is, is that we have, we're, despite all the difficulties with elections and the concerns that people have expressed and all that, in the end, if there's a, called a wave election of a bunch of um, folks that, that, that want to, you know, that believe in the Constitution the way that I believe, they could pass legislation and everything would go back. One hundred percent, right? So, um, and I'm and I'm just saying, getting back to the the forty five or forty yard lines. Not, I'm not saying you know Democrats are right here, or Dem Republicans are right here, or Libertarians or whatever. Um, but just to get us back, to kind of refocused, and that. But for that to happen, you need voters that are going to support them. So it, it I it's think all education. It all comes, it all back, comes back to education. education. The entire time we talk about this podcast, it all comes down to if people don't understand the principles and they don't understand the documents and they don't understand the vision that's supposed to be created in the nation that we're trying to work towards a more perfect union, then we're not going to be able to achieve it because we don't even know what we're aiming at. You can't build an engine if you don't know what an engine is supposed to look like. Right. You know what I mean? So we, we kind of have to go back to from the ground up building stages. Right. So you become a judge, right? Tell me what that's like, because now all of a sudden, you're, I mean, obviously you can interpret, interpret the law. You're well-educated in that field, but you're now taking on these cases in different situations where, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of, one judge's opinion is not universal. Your opinion can vary deeply based on other judges' opinions. How do you make the tough decisions like that? What did it feel like to sit on a in a position in society where, like, you are deciding the fate of each human being that comes in front of you? Obviously, my listeners would want to hear about that a little bit before we talk about what you're running for now. Yeah. So um, it, it's very humbling. Um, I, I, you I have, love that you use that word first. Okay. Not empowering, not this and that. It's very humbling. Right, because you have, you have to take it very seriously because, as you said, the fate of people's lives are in your hands, and you don't want to be wrong, um, and you don't want to flip coins or 
or, you have to trust yourself extremely. Right. So uh, the way that you do that is you you uh, co- come into every case and every everything every decision I make with an open mind. Um, read what's presented. Listen to what's argued. Uh, follow the law as it's given to. And, and I have to say, there's plenty of laws that I wish I didn't have to follow, but I follow the laws that's given to me. I don't. Uh, I'm not a legislator. I didn't run for the state legislature or for the Congress. I was appointed as a judgeship and been re- reelected several times. Um, so you have to know what your proper role is. I do think there are judges that don't know and they want to legislate, and that's a serious problem. Uh, but for the judges that um, understand their role, I call them rule of law judges. Um, and that's what you should be. You should be, right. So Now, even with that, you can have, I would call it, you know, the 45 yard line. Oh, yeah. Varying right? degrees of right. your execution of what right. decision you make, for sure. Right. But like we should be grounded in the same p- principles. Exactly. Exactly. And so uh, as a judge, you shouldn't say, well, I disagree with this law. I know what the outcome should be based on the law, but I'm going to ignore it. I have a lot of people that come up to me um, and say, you're, you're the by the book guy. This, they say, we know that if the law makes me win, then I'm going to win. If the law makes me lose, I'm going to lose because that's the law. I can appreciate that. So, right. That's what I would expect in a judge, right? Like, I don't want bias. I want you to just, like, judge based on the law. Right, right. So I've I've worked real hard uh, on that and um, become, you know, very enmeshed in understanding the court rules that we have, the the various statutes that we have to follow, the precedents that are provided to us that we, we have to follow. And um, always recognize that my role is not to legislate, but to uh, administer the law um, and uh, enforce it as it's written, as opposed to making new law. Is it difficult to enforce or back a law that you don't personally agree with? Have you ever had that situation? Uh, it happens all the time. So the the question is, is um, I'm good at compartmentalizing. So there's the policy, Michael Warren, and there's the judge, Michael Warren. So when I'm the judge, Michael Warren, let's say there's a law, I'll call it Law X. You're able to just execute on and, Law X. And Law X, I think, is a stupid law. It's a stupid law. But I have to enforce it. And if I was the policymaking guy, you I can go to the try. legislature and say, you know, that X is stupid. You really should get rid of it. Let me tell you the 25 reasons why. And they go, sorry, we like that X law. And then I'm like, okay, I have to follow it. So... Um, there are, you know, a number of areas of the law that I'm like, this makes no sense, or I understand why they did this, but it has this unintended consequence, um, and and you just have to live with it. Now, that doesn't, sometimes um, you might change, let's say I'm sentencing somebody, I have, to, I can't go above or below the the um, sure. sentencing guidelines or the but there's quite a bit of flexibility but in there's there. flexibility so I can I can make adjustments or I can change you know it, it, let's say some term I under I, I understand completely what, understand, understand what I'm saying. Saying. so you can have understanding for the person and where you fall on like how you feel about the legislation and the law right. and you say you know what I'm gonna sentence this person on the lighter degree because I can understand the angle that they're coming from but my job is to enforce the law as it right. is written. Which you're a better man than me, and I have a lot of respect for you in that way that, like, I'll give you a quick example. If I was a judge during a time of slavery, I couldn't support, I couldn't do it. I physically, I am so bad about I will die on principle of things that if I'm against something, I cannot support mm-hmm. it. But we don't need people like that as a judge. We need someone in a judge position that's going to say, okay, I need to interpret the law and then make a decision based on the current law. And if we would like to change the law, then I can make groups and education events and things like you're doing to try to hopefully put better legislators in, uh, le- legislators in power to change the laws that don't, don't work effectively. You right. know what I mean? So, right. But I would have an extremely difficult time doing that because what is written down may not be what's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a serious problem. And um, or dilemma. I I'm a member of the Michigan Judges Association, and um, which is a group of circuit and uh, appellate court judges. And um, I've joined um, a committee on the criminal law committee because they were passing laws in the legislature that I thought were unwise, and I 
wanted to stop at least more unwise laws from being passed. So we could we could say, hey, don't pass this one. Here's our reason why. So there is a policy warn. No, I that, love it. You're dealing, doing everything yeah. you can do. I so. mean, you are truly going all in because you could easily say whatever they legislate that I'm just going to enforce. Right. And that can lead to all kind of outrageous laws. You're going, OK, I'm going to enforce what it currently is, but I'm going to try to make a difference. Right. So you were a judge for how many years? Uh, I've judge been a judge yeah, for uh, 19 and a half years so far. Yeah. 19 and a half years. Yeah. And now you are running for the uh, Court of Appeals, which yes. is a whole nother level up. And what right. is the process for that? So you are an established judge. I am completely sold on the man that you are. I yeah, can't wait you. to le- re- read this book. What is the process for becoming a, a Court of Appeals judge? And what type of power difference resides in that position? Um, so I, I have this... Um, Saying so, I, I don't know if I mentioned. I not only did I work for the State Board of Education, but I also served on it for about three and a half years, and I fought for history and civics education mostly. I would have uh, guessed that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when I was uh, on the State Board of Education, I used to tease people and say, or tease myself, I'd say it's the second most anonymous position in the state, except for Court of Appeals judge. <laughs> That's so, funny. So now I'm going for Court of Appeals judge, but um, the, the, there's two ways that you become a judge in Michigan. You can either be appointed if there's a vacancy or you can uh, have a petition drive and get on the court of, uh, get on the ballot. So um, I was initially appointed by Governor Engler to the Oakland County Circuit Court and then I had a run to keep the seat um, in two years. The, at the next general election, you have to run to keep the seat and then you run if you're reelected for your full terms. So that's what I've done. On the Court of Appeals, there was a, a, a vacancy that was opened and appointed. The new judge took office on March 1st. Um, she has to run to keep the seat in November. So I'm running. The only way I can get a promotion is to run <laughs> for office. So it's a one-on-one race. Um, and the, the district is Oakland County, all of Oakland County, all of Macomb County, all of Genesee County. And Court of Appeals uh, is, is very important for a couple of reasons. First is that when you're in a, tr- so I'm a trial court judge. We have uh, probate judges, um, circuit court judges, and district court judges that make up 99% of the trial court judges. And you, if you are unhappy with your decision that's made at the trial court level, you have a right to appeal to the court of appeals. So they hear all kinds of different cases from all over the state on a wide array of different uh, laws and uh, legal decisions. And then about, uh, there's some dispute about the numbers, is caught 95 to 99% of the cases never go to the Supreme Court. There's no substantive decision from the Supreme Court. They have the great luxury of hearing whatever case they want and not hearing whatever case they want. So me, somebody files a lawsuit, it goes into what we call blind draw, it's randomly assigned to me, I have to take the case. I can't say, well, I don't want that case. I can say it's not fair for me to be on this case because uh, you know it's my mom and I can't be the judge of my mom or something like that. But otherwise, it's randomly assigned. What you're also saying is it is one of the most pivotal and crucial judicial roles in the state of Michigan because likely your court case is not going to get to the Supreme right. Court. It's going to go to the Court of Appeals as your last resort. Right. So who would you want on that court more than someone like you that is a devout, dedicated you know, judge that is all in on knowing what is right and wrong and wants to separate from bias. Because if you feel that you were unfairly prosecuted or unfairly judged upon, you would want someone that is more on that neutral line of saying, please interpret the law as it is written and decide if this was correct. I'm sold. Right. right. Well, thank you. So, I, you know, I've got 19 and a half years of being approved rule law judge. I do take it very seriously. And you're right. The Court of Appeals is extremely important and overlooked. Uh, most it's very rare to have a contested election in court of appeals, uh, but uh, I was called to to run for this, and um, you know as you said most of the important decisions don't go to the Supreme Court. So for example, the um, many of the COVID related issues that were litigated, uh, the election issues that were litigated, very few of those made it to the Supreme Court of Michigan. So. Um, it's it's incredibly important that we have the best people on that court of appeals. One hundred percent. And I was I was directly hit by all the executive orders and as a business owner. And I was a gym. I was told to shut down for six months. And, you know, I mean, 
this directly impacted my life as a man just trying to do the right thing for his community with his family. So to me, your role in society is crucial. And I need to know there are people going there that are going to say, listen, I'm not going to be biased. I'm going to try to do the right thing. I'm going to know the law. I'm going to be all in on this. So in an election process like this, are you on the November ballot? Yes. So I'm on the November ballot. You're on the November ballot. What is the the biggest, what are the biggest things that you have to do for people to support and get you into that office? Like, what does a campaign look like for someone that's never run from, for yeah, an elected that's office? That's a great question. So we have uh, two and a half million people in the district. So that's three congressional districts. It's, it's huge. Thankfully, it's compact because the three counties are, you know, they're all pretty close to each other. Um, and um, there's, first off, the most important thing is anyone that's from Oakland, Macomb, or Genesee counties to make sure they vote for Judge Michael Warren. Actually, it'll just say, Absolutely. It'll say Michael Warren uh, on the ballot. And then, um, you know, to tell all their family and friends that these elections are not high profile. There's going to be a ton of um, other electioneering going on. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, the strategy is for me to reach the voters. I'm not going to give away my campaign strategy on, online right no, now. for sure. But, uh, you know, there are ways to reach the voters that are cost effective and uh, to raise name ID and to, to, to spread our message of my experience. Um, I've tried over 360 jury trials. Um, I've um, uh, had I've been named Judge of the uh, Year, Judge of the Decade. Now I'm in the Hall of Fame of the International Association of Top Professionals, which is a New York-based international group, um, and you know, I've received a lot of accolades. I have a lot of support in the legal community, um, as well as grassroots support in uh, Macomb and Oakland and Genesee County. So I'm I'm excited by the race. It's a great adventure. Uh, but the, the key is really just getting the message out, people paying attention to this race because there's a big drop off because it's nonpartisan. So there will be um, first off, there's always a lower turnout in mid what we call midterm elections. So no president on the ballot. And there's you'll have the governor through, you know, all the other partisan races. And then it goes to the Supreme Court and then the Court of Appeals. So I'm you got to wade through that ballot. And then uh, make sure that you vote for Warren for Court of Appeals. Um, and, and there's a lot of people that don't know who to vote for when they get there. Absolutely. So really, the, the name ID and, and spreading the word. Word of is, mouth is still one of the most powerful things out there is what I'm hearing. It's the most important. Uh, hands down, what you need to do is if you're a follower of, of this gym, our athletes, if you believe in me, and a lot of people do, and a lot of people have seen the work that I've put in over the last couple decades for my community and the people around me, I am someone that's saying in a short period of time, I can know the people that I'm speaking with and I know the energy that I'm receiving and I just get a good vibe from people. If you believe in me and you want to support something that I believe is good for the state, you need to consider voting for Michael in this upcoming election because I'm sold. From sitting and talking to you, I, I can learn so much more than what you're saying. I can understand the man that has built into the man that you are today. And I have friends that are far left and I have friends that are far right. And I treat all human beings like anyone that knows me will be like, James gives people a fair shake. I care about good versus evil. I care about, right. are you trying to do the right thing and trying to make things better? Are you trying to make things worse? Right. And you have my 100% support. And some of our athletes have a couple hundred thousand followers, uh, oh, that's people awesome. that really make waves. And I hope that I can show them, hey, I'm supporting this gentleman. You should as well. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. So one of the things I, I have to ask you about on the podcast, because everybody is asking me about it, we have to discuss it. The Supreme Court recently ruled on the Roe versus Wade case. And now, to be honest and excuse my ignorance, I never looked into the initial case of Roe versus Wade that much. All I basically knew was that abortion became a federally protected thing that the states couldn't individually decide upon. So... Without having dove into it now, because I've been incredibly busy, I've had fighters going all over. I just got back from Vegas from the UFC. Um, my fiance came up to me and was like, "Can you believe that this happened?" You know what I mean? And and um, you know, obviously as a woman, you know, she's extremely fired up about it. And I said, "I haven't done the research into it to be honest, and I never like speaking when I'm not well informed on something." But I said, in my opinion, what I imagine that's happened is I don't think there is ever any real federal protection written into the constitution or the bill of law that said that federally abortion should be enforced to be legal in all the states. So I don't believe that 
the Supreme Court justices were voting on on the like, you should not be able to do this. I think they were simply saying that the federal government should not be the one making that decision and that the states should do that based on their constituency and the needs and wants of the people. And a lot of the states, you know, aren't even talking about banning them. They're saying after a certain period of time, like after six weeks or after a first trimester or second trimester. But again, forgive my ignorance because I have not done my research into it. Can you give me your take on what took place and why it was voted the way that it was? Absolutely. So um, Roe v. Wade was uh, adopted or rendered in 1973. And up until that point, um, there had not been any federal law uh, passed by a Congress. Uh, there was nothing in the Constitution. There was no federal uh, case law that um, provided that there was a, a constitutionally protected right, a federally con- constitutionally protected right to abortion. The Supreme Court, in a 7-2 decision, decided that there was. That's, that, that's a landslide. That's a landslide. That, that decision has been roundly criticized by um, a, a number of legal scholars as being um, more legislation than b- being grounded in law and uh, more driven by policy than driven by um, th- the Constitution. If you read the Constitution, the, the f- provision that they gr- graph this on is a provision in the 14th Amendment which says life, liberty, and property cannot be taken without due process of law. Well, due process of law is normally thought of as procedural due process. So if someone's going to charge you with a crime, the prosecutor wants to charge you with a crime, they have to actually issue uh, a a document that says you're charged with this crime. You have a right to an impartial decision maker. You have the right to a trial, uh, to present evidence and witnesses. Sorry, this is starting to slide off. Oh, you can. Yeah, there we go. And... um, So that's what it's normally considered. But there's this line of um, law that's um, the most recent line. There's been sporadic explosions of this and gone away. But the most recent one was um, in the 60s where they recognized a right to privacy and then eventually the the right to um, an abortion. It's called substantive due process, which sounds kind of like an oxymoron, right, because Due process is supposed to be a procedure, so you put substantive due process. So there is no right explicitly in the Constitution. Um, a th- many years later, there was a serious challenge to Roe. Uh, the, the, the court split uh, in a fractured decision. It's called Casey. And in that decision, they basically said, well, Roe was um, – it may or may not have been a smart decision at the time, but now um, – because it's precedent. The, it's precedent, so they call that stare decisis. So we're going to keep it around. But they changed the test of when you can have an abortion. So this decision, the Dobbs decision, says um, both Roe and um, Casey. Casey, thank you, uh, were erroneous. That um, they basically made up the right to an abortion in the Constitution. There's no history showing that this was a protected right. Nobody at the time in the 1800s, when um, 1868, when the 14th Amendment was adopted, believed that there were, that this protected the right to abortion. In fact, it was a crime, uh, a, often a felony. Um, in 1776, it was, or 1789 or 1791, when the Constitution was adopted, and the Bill of Rights was adopted, it wasn't protected. We're going to rely on the history when you when we use substantive due process when there isn't a specific right listed like the right to freedom of speech or the free exercise of religion. We're trying to figure out if there is a right, then we're only going to look at traditions and history. Is there something deeply rooted? So I'll give you a right that we probably all believe in, a right to travel. I'm going to Cedar Point tomorrow. It's in Ohio. We all probably believe that um, it would be wrong for the state of Michigan to stop me at the Ohio border and not allow me to leave the state. It's not in the Constitution, but... The right to travel has been well recognized in law for centuries. Or the right to get married. So um, I, I want to marry my wife, and there's no specific provision, or my fiance, there's no specific provision in the Constitution that says I have a right to marriage, but it's been firmly ingrained in society for centuries. 
or um, the right to direct the education of your children. When the Constitution was passed, the, everybody directed the education of children because there weren't any public schools. Okay, So th there are reasons uh, to, to have a due, substantive due process. The Supreme Court isn't running away from substantive due process as a whole, but they say it has to be deeply rooted in the histories and traditions of the country. And then they started to look at, um, and, and really the dissents don't have a lot of argument there. Then they say, okay, so even if that's true, does the doctrine of stare decisis stop us from reversing Roe and Casey? And this is way too complicated for your listeners and viewers, but the, the bottom line is that um, sometimes there's a thing called reliance, like, like people are relying upon the right or the, the finding of the court, or it would unsettle law, and you know this law has been settled and everybody's kind of agreed with it for a century, so why would we change it? And they, they basically said there isn't enough reliance and um, this isn't settled. There's been this massive controversy about abortion and Roe for 50 years. It's So we're not going to recognize, we're going to overturn uh, Roe because it was uh, clearly erroneous and the reasons that, not, that we might not overturn it don't work here. And then all that did is return the issue to the states. So we have a federal system where uh, it's specifically the Tenth Amendment, as well as the way the Constitution is written, and this is covered in the book, um, talks about um, the, government, the federal government is limited. It only has the powers that are expressly given to it, expressly enumerated or listed. And um, if it's not there, then everything goes back to the states. The Bill of Rights lists a, a set of um, protections against federal intrusion on free speech, free press, Second Amendment, it's, uh, you know, right to bear arms, all that. And then that became applied, most, almost all of it's been applied to the states through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Um, but if it's silent, if the Constitution's silent, then it go, stays with the states. So all they ruled was that this is a state issue, and that's, that's where we are. So basically, it sounds like in the initial Roe case, the judges were almost acting in the way that they had wished legislation was passed versus truly like, because the argument you made earlier was like, listen, it's not my judge to be a legislator when I'm being a judge. It's not my job to be a legislator when I'm being a judge. It's my job to be an efficient judge. So you believe that basically the current Supreme Court just went pure judge line for the people that did overturn it and said, hey, based on doing our job is exactly as it is described for what the Supreme Court is supposed to do. We don't believe that this should be at the federal level. We should. We believe the power should be returned to the states, which is almost matching your ideology of take the power out of the federal, get it back as close to the people as possible, and then they can, you know, regulate their lives, right? So you would say that you believe these judges, based on just judging correctly, not whether they agree with it or not, made the right decision? Yes. Yes. Again, yes. and like you said, hey, I've had a ton of laws that I don't agree with. I've had a ton of laws right. that I'm not happy with. Right. I have a, a lot of times that I want to go back to the legislation and say, hey, guys, can we change this? How do we change this? But if I'm being a judge, and, and that's exactly my fiance and I got in an argument yesterday, not a bad one at each other. But she was saying it just shouldn't have been. And I said, yeah, but I don't believe they were interpreting what they believe to be right from wrong. I believe they were interpreting where should the power reside based on our system. And I believe that should be back to the states. Right. That's exactly. And that's, that's a man that is not educated in that world. But it, it makes sense for me. Otherwise, why would you do something like that? Because you're going to spark outrage. You, it's an incredibly emotional topic. It's right. going to get people upset. You know, but if you're trying to follow the laws, it's written, you can see why it can be argued. The only point that I didn't fully understand, but again, I'm far too uneducated to speak on this, is reliance. Because in the nation, people have absolutely relied on that since Roe versus Wade. Countless people rely on that as being a, a, as a, an accessible part of this culture, and they've used that. So it would seem to me that the reliance factor has been extremely high. Now, there are some people that are deathly opposed to it for religious reasons or other reasons that are like under no circumstances should this take place. But reliance has absolutely been a part of culture, but maybe I'm misinterpreting the way that you mean reliance. Well, no, the, uh, it's a, that's a great question. So there is a fight among the majority and the minority in 
the Dobbs decision about what what the meaning of reliance is. So the you're, you're kind of reflecting the minority's view that the whole culture relies on this right. I wouldn't say the whole culture, but well, I would a, say a large, a, a large portion. Large portion. That's right, large portion. Where um, the majority is saying, well, um, no, it, first off, there's all this controversy about it, so there isn't really reliance. Um, the states are fighting against it, so there really isn't reliance. So reliance is and, like universally adopted and is a part of culture is what you're describing reliance to as well? Well, th- that's part of it. And then I, I, you know, the other part would be you know, unless you were just about to get an abortion, you're not really relying on it because um, th- it's not for the whole world. It's just for a few people, right? So that I think they really narrowed their definition of reliance. And there's a lot of scholarship. I, I've been listening to some of the podcasts where they're fighting over, you know, d- did the Supreme Court really give it short shrift? But that's only one factor. There's a whole slew of factors. Absolutely. And so they, they said overall th- these factors uh, favor reversing. Makes sense. Well, Michael, it has been, we have talked for a full length feature film. It's been an hour and 40 minutes, but man, 